So the subject of this book is how marginalized groups come to assert their rights in a transnational process that makes the invisible visible, and ultimately, I argue, transforms the politics of states. Uh, put most broadly, it seeks to explain the changing ideas of state and society in world politics using the case of norms governing LGBT rights. Uh, there's a personal and an intellectual answer to that, to that question um, of what motivated me to write this book. Uh, the project dates back actually to 2004, 2006 when I was completing uh, a master's degree in Berlin. And it was a time when Berliners of various backgrounds were organizing to participate in marches for LGBT equality in Polish cities. Um, I stumbled across a press release concerning a march in Warsaw, um, which sparked a long uh, curiosity about the transnational nature of LGBT politics and the questions it raised. The political behavior that seemed obvious to many of the participants challenged the fundamentals um, of what I had learned of politics in the classroom, like what was rational about marching for rights in a foreign context where such rights would not benefit you directly, why did such activism meet forceful resistance in some cases and not in others, uh, the stunning but uneven diffusion of legal rights um, and societal recognition across states also puzzled me. Uh, so during the decade, well, I guess more than a decade that I spent thinking about the issues related to this book, I would be amazed most of all by the striking changes that occurred around the globe. Um, indeed, it is really remarkable if we think that Catholic Ireland would adopt same-sex marriage by popular vote, or that the small island of Malta would become a tra trailblazer on trans recognition. So the fact that, for example, so many states have approved same-sex unions um, is not uh, just a mere coincidence, as Kelly Coleman has argued um, in, her, uh, in her work. So uh, under the right conditions, it seemed that LGBT people could be their own emancipators, in some sense of that word, um, in that they could be, uh, they could be the path toward, uh, that visibility could be their path towards rights. Uh, yeah, so I do think that change around LGBT rights has a transnational dimension. At least it is one important compo component of the explanation. Um, I argue that channels of visibility that tie states to their respective communities influence the spread of norms. So a norm may exist, but its felt intensity um, uh, varies across states. So in doing so, I develop a concept um, that I call norm visibility, and I argue that it, is, um, that it is a necessary part of diffusion. By norm visibility, I refer just quite simply to the relative ability of uh, publics and governments to see and interact with ideas and images that define standards of appropriate behavior. And by defining new standards of acceptability, these transnational sources of normative change introduce uh, new ways of understanding oneself for many LGBT people in various contexts. So this is true both for LGBT people and for the societies um, uh, at large that surround them. I argue that differing degrees of visibility have produced different outcomes for socio-political change across states. Uh, building on theories of international relations and contentious politics that deal with norm diffusion, the book focuses on variation in the changed legal status and societal perceptions of sexual minorities. In doing so, it deals with the existential conflict between various actors and the tension between competing norms. Uh, scholars have argued that we need to study clashes of norms to understand how the world changes, and I think um, if that is our goal, then the case of LGBT norms definitely offers a case for that. I've always seen myself more as building on previous literatures than departing from them, but there are, there are some novelties to this book. Uh, much of the uh, older scholarship on LGBT politics was focused on domestic explanations, um, such as religious cultural context, economic wealth and modernity, the development of the welfare state, the organizing capacity of social movements, the level of democratization, um, and the pluralization of sexual practice, among others, were explanations for why we see change. Um, around these rights. Uh, but the diversity of states that have come to promote LGBT rights uh, today, so in, in more recent decades, muddles some previous theories about the domestic factors that affect uh, the recognition of these rights. So it's not always the most likely cases that, uh, that, that make changes. Uh, the earlier arguments grew out of experiences charted in first mover states like the Protestant Nordic cont uh, countries, and the Netherlands, um, but have become complicated in the new century. For example, at this time, um, over, uh, over 20 European states have adopted some form of same-sex union at the federal level, and few of them resemble the first mover states uh, we're accustomed to in terms of the domestic factors l listed above. 
So while these earlier arguments took us a long way, they have lost some of their traction in recent decades surrounding the surprising changes that I, on LGBT rights norms that I mentioned um, at the outset, so, which my book, I hope, um, is helping uh, to, uh, to contribute the, to, uh, to the literature that looks at the surprising changes.